Hi, this webinar is brought to you by the Regulate Reservices Partnership. Uh, thanks to generous funding from the European Union's Regional Development Fund. Uh, we're going to be covering the gyms, leisure centre, sports halls and uh, pools sector. A little bit of a small print at the beginning. Views expressed by any speaker are the speakers alone. They don't necessarily represent the views of the UK government or the European Commission or the body the speaker represents. You will hear some science on virus transmission, efficacy of face coverings. The information is brought from various studies internationally. It will be made available in the follow-up information and circulated, and it's merely provided to help support businesses understand the context of the guidance and or the views you'll hear today. Everything's fast moving, the science is evolving, thus the advice on what is adequate safety measures is constantly changing as well. Now, whilst efforts have been made to make sure this is up to date, please recognise we are regulators, not scientists. Uh, some aspects may not reflect the most current scientific thinking, nor is it necessarily comprehensive. And depending on when you're viewing this webinar, a lot of changes in a few weeks. So you should seek your own legal or scientific advice where appropriate. This is based on English law. Official guidance may differ for premises in other parts of the UK. Although much of the practical guidance that you're going to hear today will be useful to any business um, anywhere in the UK. Mention of or participation by any business or body during the webinar doesn't necessarily amount to a recommendation by the council. We have neither vetted them nor confirmed their premises to be COVID secure. Uh, the webinar has been recorded for the benefit of any business that's not able to join us today. So, with a small print out of the way, um, we are the Regulatory Services Partnership. We're a council owned service serving London boroughs of Merton, Richmond upon Thames, and Wandsworth. We have over 50 highly trained staff who which make up the range of local authority regulators that you would typically come across in your dealings with local authorities. Um, we have an advisory and enforcement role in respect of COVID regulations, um, where, but obviously our focus um, is on supporting uh, responsible businesses get it right. Now I say obviously that is our focus. I'm very much aware being in this job for 20 years, talking to businesses of all sizes, um, that there is sometimes a perception that uh, regulators are, uh, you know, the business police, wear the red tape. Um, that's very much not the case. Um, we are here to help you guys get things right. And really, the enforcement is a last resort. And hopefully, the fact that we're doing this webinar is, is um, you know, an example of that. We want you guys to um, get the information that helps you make the more informed decisions to keep, that, keep you guys safe. Speakers today are myself, Paul Maloszewski Reed. I'm a Chartered Trading Standards Practitioner and Ravina Plural, who's our health and safety inspector. Um, she's one of our staff that goes out and does these visits um, to businesses of all sectors looking at their COVID um, compliance and risk assessments. Also, we hear from uh, Paul Lisenberg. He's a manager at our local Pure Gym, and he will talk about the things they've been doing to keep uh, customers safe. And I'll summarise the guidance that's available from Swim England and PWGAT uh, GAT, uh, in terms of advice for pools and spa pools. So a little bit of an overview of what you'll hear over the next 40 odd minutes. Uh, the science to give context, practical steps to reduce risk in your building, your trade association's own guidance, um, face coverings, visors and gloves, bringing customers back, you know, once you've done everything right, how do you get those customers that are scared back in the door? Um, things to think about in terms of recovering cost of safety measures, um, links to financial and other support, um, how to safeguard your sector from another shutdown. And then there'll be a Q&A at the end with the panel of speakers. And for that purpose, please use the chat function. So context of the virus has been lots uh, in media. Things have changed, as I say, constantly evolving. You'll have heard different things in, uh, from different places. So let's just have some context so we're all at uh, you know, a kind of level playing field. So uh, whenever we talk, breathe, cough, sneeze, uh, droplets of water are released from our mouths. 
These large droplets typically fall very quickly to the floor, um, but those droplets that lose their moisture, uh, some of these will um, become these fine particles, airborne particles that are suspended in the air. You will have heard the official advice from WHO for, for months has been that the virus is transmitted mainly through these large droplets when we cough and sneeze. Those droplets fall into surfaces, hence uh, the increase in surface cleaning and also hand washing because when we touch those surfaces that have the virus, we need to wash our hands rather than uh, touch our faces and uh, transmit the virus to ourselves. Um, this is why the advice has typically been around these physical barriers, screen barriers, face visors between customers and staff, because those catch these physical droplets that would uh, would go one, two meters away. International scientific opinion is evolving, so now there is strong evidence to suggest the virus can spread in the air through much tiner particles that float around after we talk or breathe out. So these tiny particles called aerosols, they can actually remain suspended in the air for several hours, two days, um, and they can travel through building via air currents. So they're so uh, small, so light, that gravity doesn't drop them to the floor. So think about this in your, inside your own premises. It's not just coughing and sneezing, it's when customers are talking, when they're breathing out, these tiny aerosols are being released. The other important thing to be mindful of, most people with the infection will be unaware because 80% of those who are, have been infected display mild or don't show any symptoms at all. And of the minority, so the small number who do go on to develop symptoms, there's a high rate of transmission. So they transmit the virus to others uh, to quite an extent, up to two days before they develop symptoms, which might include at higher temperature, for example. So these people, you and I, could have the virus, and unfortunately we don't know it until we get tested. So we are working, shopping, socializing as normal. You need to think about that because when you're designing your processes, your safety measures, it's not just for those who know they've got the virus or who display obvious signs of high temperatures, coughing. It is the majority who don't display any of those signs. So obviously it's great news, governments give permission for uh, most sectors to reopen, but having that legal permission doesn't mean to say it's safe to do so. If you open too early, there's risk to yourself, staff and customers, um, and you obviously want to avoid the need to close down. You may be open now uh, and have concerns yourself that maybe things aren't as safe as you like. So do be very mindful of that. Listen to the advice that will come from both regulators and your industry experts to make a, a, the best decision for yourselves uh, and staff. So the, these are some steps that you should consider. Move your business outdoors. You know, customer queues, seating, waiting areas, uh, find solutions with neighboring businesses. You might not have enough uh, pavement, outdoor space. Your neighbor may have forecourt have those discussions to see uh, what can be arranged. Obviously, as much as possible, you want to limit any waiting around, but it may not be always possible. So the best thing is to have no queues, no waiting, but where that isn't possible, look to have those uh, taking place outdoors. Why? Because out of 300 odd outbreaks, only one was connected to outdoor transmission. Uh, so lots of studies looking at virus carriers and where they were. Um, so this was around 7,000 uh, people that had caught the virus. Uh, there was only one incident uh, with two people um, regarding outdoor transmission. The thinking is that virus aerosols typically dilute too quickly in outside air to pose a risk. So with that in mind, two options. One is Get, uh, apply for the fast track pavement license. However, um, and there's a load of Q and A's, uh, it will answer all your questions around this in the follow up. That is designed for just the sale of food and drink, uh, which obviously doesn't apply to your business. Uh, and so if you want similar uh, ability to, to have pavement licenses, to put waiting areas, seating outdoors, talk to your trade association, 
they're in the best place to represent your views to government. The second, op second option has nothing to do with pavement licenses. Some biz, uh, councils are just making the decision uh, to widen pavement, to do you know, practical things to help businesses out. So you'll see in some um, areas around the country, uh, things like this, where barriers have been put up to narrow roads, widen pavement, so all businesses in that area can get seating outdoors. There is a downside to that. Um, the police uh, do want to make everybody aware that uh, you know, the current terrorism national threat level is substantial, which means an attack is likely. Um, we're not, um, the latest information I had was that they weren't aware of any particular threats in our uh, three London boroughs. This is obviously constantly changing, but there are things you can do to protect your customers. Um, police recommend visual deterrence um, using street furniture. So for example, in the H&M, uh, picture to the left, you'll see everybody's queuing on the road to the right of the barriers. If the store simply recommended everybody queue to the left of those big metal barriers, that would make them a lot safer. Not every premise will have street furniture outside their, uh, their doors, so what you can do is, similar to what the pub here has done, you can put plant troughs, other things um, that act as a visual deterrent. Now, you may think, well, that won't stop a car, but this is, this is sort of like burglar alarms. A burglar alarm will look for the easiest target, and it's exactly the same with somebody behind a car that wants to do harm. They will look for whatever the easiest target is uh, to cause maximum damage. So doing these little things um, for outside your premise can make a huge difference to keep your customers safe. There's lots more advice, guidance, training on the um, counter terrorism app by the Met Police. Uh, it's called PSO London Shield. Even if you have a premise outside London, this is still going to be relevant to yourself. Okay, now let's discuss the steps you must take. Some businesses queried um, the government sector guidelines. They are just that. It's only guidance. We don't really need to follow them. So. Let me give you the context here. Every business before COVID, after the pandemic's uh, over, has to uh, do risk assessments part of operating a business. And you then have to minimize any risks you identify to your staff and customers. So the government guidelines are basically uh, your trade associations sitting around with uh, some uh, scientists uh, to look at uh, these, this concern with the virus and to come, come up with practical measures that they think can help you in your type of business to minimise risks. So it's, you know, it's kind of the best advice that's out there at the moment and obviously it's constantly evolving. Um, now, uh, obviously your next question will probably be, well, what if we don't follow the guidance? Uh, you know, are we going to see enforcement action? You know, what kind of cost is attached to that? I would suggest to you enforcers uh, are the least of your worries because uh, you'll, you'll see what happens when, a, when there is an outbreak um, in a business premise, it's all over the national news, uh, that will likely affect your reputation. Even if it doesn't, they may need to close for a few weeks. Some of their customers will think twice about going back to that premise. Um, and then it also might have repercussions for your insurance uh, if you didn't follow the official guidance. Uh, and that led to uh, some incident and other costs associated, you may find difficulty claiming back um, insurance for that. Now, appreciate there's lots of information out there. This is new to everyone, including the regulator. So it's, it's been a constant game of catch up uh, week to week as things evolve. Um, so where do you start? So this is a really good starting place, this web uh, page here, you can, and answer five, six questions about business sector, employee numbers, et cetera, et cetera. And then it will give you uh, directly the relevant guides uh, for your business. Now, one of the things it will do is it will give you the government sector guide that's applicable, but sometimes it's, you're, there's more than one. So uh, a gym is obviously a place of uh, you know, fitness. So you've got that guidance. You might have staff meetings, uh, so you would look at the uh, office-related uh, guidance in that aspect. 
And so it's sometimes one or two bits of guidance that are relevant to yourself. Um, I would recommend downloading the guide where, where it's an option because in the PDF version, there's actually a tick box, uh, which has got a checklist. So it just makes it a little bit easier to note off to yourself, yes, I've done this bit, I've done this bit, because as you'll see looking at the guidance, lots of pages, lots of advice uh, and thing, different things to consider. And it can be uh, you know, a bit of a job just uh, satisfying yourself, reassuring yourself that you've covered everything. So that's something to do. Um, I would also recommend you look at your trade association guide. For some sectors, the trade association guidance is effectively morphed into the official guide, but it isn't uh, necessarily always that cut and dry. Um, so do look at both because that can be a lot more personalized to your type of business. Um, for example, with swimming pools, um, the best kind of guidance is that coming out of you know Swim England and uh, PWATG, which we're going to touch on shortly, that's where you get your detail um, of how to keep um, leisure pools um, and spa pools safe. You need to do a risk assessment, as I said, it's unique to you. I thought I've just mentioned the tick box, the checklist. Don't see this as a tick box exercise. Don't feel I have to do this because I've been told I have to do it, or um, there's some law telling me I should do it, and there might be consequences to that. Um, this is, you know, there to keep you safe, your staff safe, your customers safe. Um, clearly, nobody, neither your staff nor you, when you go into your workplace, wants to go into an environment that's unsafe, um, pick up a virus and, and uh, potentially take that back home with you. So clearly, it's, you know, there's a personal interest like never before in, this, in these circumstances. Um, we can't go into detail for every business type uh, clearly in a webinar, but this is uh, one way that you can think through and it gives you an inkling of the level of detail you need to consider. So think of it in terms of customer journey. Before they even visit the gym, as much as possible, you're trying to get information from them. Uh, so say there's going to be a session with a personal trainer or uh, there's some kind of questionnaire they usually fill in to attend a particular class. Those conversations need to take place away from the premise where possible. Then the enter, so think about touch points. When the exit, maybe there's a different exit, you're limiting touching or opening of doors. During their visit, uh, you know, not just a case of the fact they're using the equipment, going for a swim, um, think about changing, think about using toilets. Uh, so, you know, walk through the typical customer journey when they're in your premise. Supplier journey, similar thing when you're getting um, goods delivered. Staff journey, I'll give you a little bit more detail here so you, you get a concept of the level of detail you need to get into. So before um, staff enter work, they need to travel to work. They might have a face covering. Where is that being kept? Um, making sure it's obviously quite separate from um, other things in case to prevent cross contamination. After work, they may be wearing a uniform. So uh, clothes are generally low risk, but there is a risk that uh, contamination can be picked up if the clothes touch a surface that has virus on it. So you need to talk to staff about changing clothes immediately when they get home. Uh, washing at 60 degrees. You know, we've all been taught for years to be environmentally friendly, wash at 30, wash at 40. Um, so uh, don't see this that you're spoon feeding staff. This, you know, we, this is a very different uh, circumstances for everybody. Don't assume staff all think about these things themselves. Um, and then you need to think, say to them, well, you need to wash hands thoroughly after you uh, put your um, uniform for wash. So that is just a very small uh, uh, example of one thing to consider, um, but that's the kind of level of detail you need to get into. So you would do the initial training, you then need to think about every so often, whether that's three, four weeks, um, again, it's not set in stone, um, whether you need to retrain uh, staff in, in particular areas to check that they're still following your guidelines, staying safe. Don't assume you tell everybody this once um, and then that's it. Um, they will be doing it for, for the upcoming months. Do be mindful, this is going to be around for about a year, it's estimated, so refresher training will be something to consider. So, 
reduce the risk indoors. Um, we've had months of fear in the media around virus living on hard surfaces for up to three days. So don't touch anything and clean everything constantly. Um, you know, we were all kind of living in this uh, very kind of fearful messaging uh, and uh, all uh, buying up uh, supplies of Domestos uh, and cleaning our house to a ridiculous extent. Uh, I know I was. <laughs> um, knowledge has evolved in this area. Um, we now know the amount of virus that lives on a surface. It can actually drop. It drops it by half after a few hours and continues dropping. Um, three days is kind of worst case scenario, um, and there, it varies uh, depending on material. Now, what, this kind of evolving uh, knowledge um, has led to changes in the advice uh, and uh, messaging that you'll hear from some disease control centers. So, just one example: the U.S. authorities are. Uh, update their advice to say the risk from touching surfaces isn't thought to be the main way the virus spreads. Cl now, clean and hand washing is still important, clearly. Um, there is a risk, although it's smaller than we, we first thought, but the highest risk appears to be from aerosols, those tiny particles floating around the air. So think about this when customers are talking, breathing in your premise. So naturally, good ventilation is the priority to uh, keep a, a safe building. There's, I'm not going to get into the detail of this. There's follow-up information that has 15 practical recommendations from uh, heating and air conditioning experts. Um, talks about everything. Basics of just keeping the doors and windows open. What you're trying to do with any of this is in any way possible, get as much fresh air going through the property, okay? So you can use fans, you can use air conditioning units, as long as it's fresh air, not recirculating existing air. Um, you need to think about uh, staff activities uh, that occur for 30 minutes or more in unventilated areas, whether those are essential, whether they need to be stopped. Um, even goes down to toilet flushing, you know, keeping the lid closed. So they really think through all of the uh, different things in terms of keeping the air uh, clean and, uh, and as uh, virus particle free as possible. Social distancing, uh, still a big uh, factor in keeping everybody safe. Naturally, there's been a lot of questions from businesses uh, when we went to the one meter plus um, rule. What does that mean? Is one meter now safe? Well, one meter is not safe. Um, you know, just mild cough droplets travel for six meters. One meter is up to 10 times greater risk than standing two meters away from someone. So be mindful of the context that this change has happened. Uh, we're not suddenly saying it's safe, so we stand around one meter away. It's because we recognize that businesses, many businesses cannot survive um, operating uh, two meters away or one meter, uh, uh, any um, more than one meter away. And so it's a compromise to allow businesses to survive uh, whilst keeping their uh, business operating in a safe way. So it is very much one meter plus mitigation. What is mitigation? That's a whole host of things. Um, just in a nutshell, to mitigate against the risk from the large droplets when we sneeze, cough, those are the ones that drop quite quickly, two meters odd away from, from ourselves. Um, you're talking about configuring the exercise equipment. So uh, treadmills are side to side, or people are sitting on um, row machines back to back. So as they're, they may be one meter away, but um, they're breathing out in opposite directions. So one person's on the treadmill facing this way, the other person's on, tre uh, not treadmill, row machine facing that way. Yeah, so that's seating. Screens uh, is another option, physical barriers. Now those are great for large droplets. For aerosols, it's not that simple because as I say, these particles float around for a long time. And so you need to use ventilation, good ventilation. Um, and effective face coverings. That is obviously a lot more tricky uh, when people are exercising. Different countries taking different approaches in this regard. In the UK, uh, customers are not required to wear face covering in the gym. 
uh, and there is potentially some you know health repercussions if you're heavy, uh, doing a lot of heavy exercise and, and breathing um, into your face covering um, it, there is a potential for, um, for harm so um, it's not uh, practical um, for many people to wear a covering some other things to consider let the sun in most of the coronavirus particles can be killed off in seven minutes of sunlight. However, windows stop the virus killing UVC rays. Um, so you might have seen um, online on websites and big marketplaces, UV light sterilizers. Put these UV lights on your ceiling, they'll kill all the viruses, keep your premise safe. Those 99.9% uh, confidence in saying those are a scam. Reason being, UVC rays, whilst effective at killing the virus, they're also really bad for humans. And so the current technology easily available in the market um, um, is, um, the let's rephrase that, the technology um, is being looked at to come up with UVC rays that are slightly different, that are not harmful to humans but the experts say that is likely to be a year away after the pandemic's over. Um, and so whilst you can buy things like containers, so sealed con metal containers that you sterilize combs, equipment in, and those are fine because they're sealed off, the rays don't harm consumers. Um, lights uh, that sterilize with UVC rays are highly likely to be a scam. Uh, and if they are available, uh, they would probably be, as I say, it doesn't, I'm not the expert in this here, but from uh, from what I heard from experts and what I've read, is they're not available. If they were, they would be extremely expensive. Keeping indoor relative humidity to 50-60%, the reason is those uh, virus particles retain moisture, drop quickly to surfaces rather than float around for hours. Do be mindful of this on colder days because as you put heating up, uh, humidity can drop to as low as 20%. Keep noise levels to a minimum. So talking louder generates a lot more particles than talking more quietly. So no sports broadcast, no loud music. Um, that encourages people to talk. Now clearly in a gym, um, it's normal to have loud music. You go, to, you go to kind of dance classes, you go to fitness classes, and you would typically have loud music on. The reason for this is because loud music then encourages people to talk louder, to be heard. Now, that's slightly different in a gym context. If it, people are in a class, the music is obviously going to motivate us. They're not there chit-chatting to, their, uh, to their, their neighbor in the class with them. So um, music could be fine in that context. We get questioned, uh, so, um, you know, how long is too long to be around with somebody uh, with a virus? And um, or how long do we need to hear a room and all these sort of questions around time? Science, uh, we're not there yet in terms of, uh, you know, black and white answer. And there's lots of variables to this. But what I can say is it's reported that we need to breathe in a few hundred or a few thousand of the viruses to overwhelm the immune system. Again, that varies person to person. Um, official, the closest thing in terms of official advice in terms of timing is uh, looking at the track and trace guidelines. So where somebody is found to be a virus carrier, track and trace, try to trace everybody that's been next to that person um, in it from a distance shorter than two meters for 15 minutes or more and that doesn't mean to say you definitely have picked up the virus um if you've been next to them for 15 minutes but that is kind of where they picture in terms of what they consider to be people at risk near virus carriers the other bit of um evidence um that's uh, came up in studies is um people in, in a lab um measured the amount of particles that are released when people talk. So they looked at uh, quiet talking, loud talking, and based upon various um, studies and other research done in related fields, they estimated that just one minute of loud talking could generate 1,000 virus-containing droplets. 
that's one minute so you can imagine having a, a conversation for 10 minutes or more in a loud environment that's thousands of virus containing particles coming from the virus carrier and then breathed into their friend uh, that they're having that conversation with so as much as possible we need to limit the chit chat limit the amount of conversation taking place uh, between staff and customers um, remind customers you know and this is going to happen people friends will come to the gym together uh, you know they will exercise they will talk um, and you know it's it, it's a social place um, but you need to do your best to remind people to m minimize chit chat try and encourage them you know save the save the chat in before or after the gym or in whichever uh, you know um, um, well ventilated area that you have at your premise so that is uh, a lot of context but hopefully that makes the guidance and what you're hearing from uh, me and other speakers um, makes it a little bit more sense why certain uh, advice has been issued so we're going to move on to Paul Lisenberg he's from our, our local pure gym and they'll be talking about uh, what their their company's been doing in this area hi everybody um just a quick round i'm the manager at pure gym in london wandsworth um i've been at various other pure gyms throughout the country working uh sutton and Purley in particular but obviously i'm at this club now um, and these measures you're about to see from the pictures are specifically from the club in wandsworth because obviously it relates to um our borough etc etc um paul's talked about the risk assessments you would imagine and this the fact that our company had these risk assessments prepared well in advance um, and the week prior to opening or actually two weeks prior to us actually getting the go ahead to open the majority of these um, risk risks were implementing the club and the pictures you're going to see were already Im implemented um, the gut if you're I'm sure everybody's aware if you're not I'll just give you a brief background UK active are the sort of the governing body for gyms um, and it was their sort of go-ahead discussions with the government that allowed gyms to open when they did, as long as certain measures were implemented. Um, and I know for a fact that Pure Gym were at the forefront of um, helping write these uh, guidelines for all gyms. Um, so straight away, you can see the first picture on your slide. Um, the thing you're going to see a lot on our particular ones is in the. If you can see that police queue here down the bottom right, it says "Train Safe." That's our sort of. Um, mantra that we're going everywhere so all our all our marketing and stuff has got train safe everywhere it's specifically for pure gym i have to say that um so that sign you see there um luckily and we opened on saturday at eight o'clock in the morning um we haven't had to use that as yet there was uh, 28 people waiting outside the door at eight o'clock in the morning on saturday when i let them all in and they rushed in and um they um uh, I haven't got up to what I would deem as my capacity. And if anybody wants to come at me with a question, that I'll talk about that generally. So that sign would be sitting outside. Um, the one just slightly to the left, you can see it's just our guidelines. Just that's our guidelines that you are throughout the club. Thanks, Paul. Um, so on our, our membership, again, I apologize if everybody's fully aware of the way that our gym operates, but our gym operates on a pod system. So those pods you can see there, um, all those pods you can see there you have to be a member to enter the club and on your you have a pin number that you put into the pads uh, and keypad and into the gym however to avoid contact we've implemented a qr code scan reader on the members um, app so they can just literally put that underneath as a diagram shows and enter without touching it however there is a hand sanitizer in on the side there so before you enter and also when you enter the club on the other side of the pods there's another hand sanitizer as there is throughout and there again you can see the marketing train so in the gym that's right on the gym itself the, the sort of measures we've implemented um paul's talked about the one meter and one meter one meter plus which whether it's confusing for everybody whether we are or not um we've kind of kept it quite simple it's two meters and that's it um, it's the guideline. So those boxes you see are two by two. So the way that it works in our gym is, is I try to keep it simple for members. If there's a white box, you can train in it. If there's no white box, you can't train in it. So if you can see those benches, the way they work, and just slightly to the right, you can see the other benches. Um, in the far distance, you can see the hexagonal cleaning station there. 
which has uh, wipes, um, blue towel, and hand sanitizers, and it's advertising as well. And in this particular gym, if you've never, if you've, if you've ever been in there before, you know there's one, two, there's four, three floors, and I have those cleaning stations. Um, I have eight of them spread throughout the gym, so um, nobody can sort of say there isn't. That's my studio. Um, we've had to reduce capacity on the studio, and again, you can see the boxes that are two by two. So the green dots indicate that's where the member stands, and they train. So I've had to reduce my capacity of classes drastically, and there it tells you where you can and can't train. Um, the, the challenges, I think, uh, will come probably tonight when I have a few people come in and they can only get nine spaces available, but it's to do with the distancing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's certain classes I can't run. Um, there's a treadmill. And you can see that's, a, that's not my gym, but it's, they're all exactly the same in every pure gym because we're following the same risk assessments. Every other treadmill is out. So that's the way it's, uh, it's been. And there are a number of machines very, uh, very similar to that, uh, where you see that cross on it, so it's quite clear. And there's a number of those everywhere because uh, we've had to remove some of our machines. Like I say, referring to this, this cleaning stations, we ask, um, Ironically, I've been in the industry a long time, um, so I laugh when I say this. We ask members to wipe the machine down before and after they use it, especially before and then after use it. Um, they should have been doing this before anyway, but now with this COVID, look, in my feedback this weekend, I've never seen so many members clean the gym before and after, which is fantastic. But that's what they're asked to do. So we have can got... Just, can you just touch on that automatic mist and spray you mentioned? Which yeah, I think sure. As you're, practical stuff. you're looking at the picture now of, I'm going to describe in my language, that's a spray gun. So the guidance that we've had, we have got spray guns that you spray onto a blue tissue and wipe down the kit. However, some of the research that one of our sort of, uh, scientists working for us talked about was actually spray gun does um, spread the spray, if you want, all over the place. So rather than being specific. So we have these what are called misting guns. And it's like, electric, it's like a battery operated thing that sprays a mist, cleaning fluid onto the, onto the, if you're looking at that bike, onto that bike, and then you wipe down as well. So in other words, we're creating a mist as opposed to spraying um, the solution everywhere. Um, I think it's just based on the fact that particles going, we're trying to control the particles and it's coming from a mist. So um, we've got one of those as well as well as those spray ones there. And then you can see some members, again, in the white boxes, wiping down the kit before and after. Other, and the, in the forefront of the picture, you can see the wipes, which in addition to those hexagonal cleaning stations, we have available as well. So people wipe down the kit and the, and the um, before and after use. And I said, so far, I mean, we're only just into it, that's been the case. In our locker rooms, again, it's, this is mainly to do with social distancing. Um, and as you can appreciate, I can, if I, We've got a number of staff on the gym floor to make sure this is all adhered to. In the changing rooms, it's slightly different. And obviously there's no cameras in there, so I can't see that that's happening. So what we've done to eliminate, obviously to, to use the social distancing, we've taken out a number of lockers. So all the ones with red stickers on, you can't use. And in the, just on the left-hand side, you can see the ones that are available. And maybe if you can just about see on the floor, there's a green dot. And we're asking that members get changed in those, on those dots in those areas. Does it reduce the capacity within the changing room? Yes, it does. Um, but it's, it's our way of making some measures uh, available. Showers are available. Um, our women's one, which is that particular one, have cubicles, so that's okay. In the men's, it's slightly different because if they have a, a tray underneath, so you can literally put your hand between each cubicle underneath. So we've had to remove every other one of those. Um, I don't know if you've got a slide of the, fo of the um, picture of the... Um, Hair dryers, Paul. But when the hair dryers in, no, he hasn't got one. Our hair dryers again have been taken out. So there's only two hair dryers available. Uh, and those do not use signs have been put on a lot of them because of, again, when you're using the hair dryer and, and you're breathing outside near it, it's just spreading the particles. So just to remove it, we've taken out uh, the majority of our hair dryers in both changing rooms. Um, that's why the changing rooms looks again just to adhere to the social distancing. Okay. Um, I'll pick up on this next. <laughs> yeah, I saw the next um, can you, Anything else that you think is helpful? I think also the capacity up uh, and anything yeah, else I think is helpful to, to touch on. Yeah, I think it definitely. I mean, again, across our estate, um, what we've done is it depends. It, it doesn't, people have been saying to me, how many members you've got on, are your, is your capacity based on the amount of members you're not, you've got. 
it's not. You saw those white boxes um, and you didn't see a picture, but obviously you can imagine I've got my treadmills and bikes, etc., as well as my machines where you can sit down and do the weights, etc. They would account, they would um, be stations. So what we've done is we've counted how many stations I have available. So if everybody came in and went on the station, that's my capacity. And then obviously I've got my class on top. So give you some idea, my membership pre-lockdown was 4,520, I think it was. Um, the day before I opened, that went down by about 900. It's gone back up quite quickly this weekend. Um, but my capacity to enter this club is 91. So we have an app and I can check, and I can probably show it to you right now, just to give you some sort of real time information you can see. If I can put it up to the camera, you can see the app and that tells me I have 29 people in this club right now. So when I get to 80% of that capacity, I will man the front door just to welcome people and tell them that you're okay to come in. But at the moment we hit 91, then the pods stop working. So people cannot enter. And the sign you saw the very first picture for the queue here, that's when that kicks in. Um, interesting from the council point of view is obviously my if you don't know, my gym goes straight onto the onto the pavement. Uh, next door to me is a post office, and uh, their queuing system goes right past my gym. So again, the logistics of how that works in terms of people queuing outside two meters apart, which we will implement by one of us staffing at the door, is somewhat tricky. The only good news is is that the post office is generally busy during the day and I know I'll be busy of the evening so therefore the post office will close and therefore the, the meter rule uh, two meter rule will be okay um, but that comes in when we hit capacity of 91 and the closest I got to that was 60 61 on um, Sunday or Sunday around about 10 o'clock 11 o'clock but we haven't got there but it's not Monday night yet so we'll have to wait and see um, is that okay Paul? Yeah, that's really that's really helpful. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about uh, some a few other things, and then I'm going to um, touch on your train safe because I think that's a really good yeah, example problem. of reaching out to your customer. Thanks very much, Paul. Okay, so that was an example of what not one uh, national train are doing in the UK. Um, in contrast, let's look at what we're seeing in other countries. Um, example to the left, this is a gym in the US. They've screened off uh, their customers. That clearly is great for the large droplets with cough and sneezes, um, but it's um, not likely to help in regards to the aerosols. Uh, obviously, there's no roof uh, on that uh, screen, and there's an open, a large opening that people walk in and out. So the aerosols that are being breathed out um, are just floating around, uh, going above uh, the screen and floating back down. They're going in and out of those entrances. Uh, and so that in itself, those screens by themselves wouldn't be sufficient. Um, there would have to be good ventilation in that premises as well. In the example to the right, this is a, an outdoor class in Canada. Um, everybody's in their own bubble. Uh, now it's questionable whether that's necessary because uh, those people are a good two odd meters apart anyway, and they're outdoors. Uh, I've already mentioned the risk outdoors is extremely low. Um, and so it's highly, um, it, it's questionable whether those bubbles are necessary at all there. However, uh, you know, the measures that you put in place are for two reasons. One is doing the right thing to keep your customers safe. Two, uh, giving customers reassurance. Uh, remember that a lot of people still have a fear of going into indoor spaces. Um, or being around um, anybody um, because of the virus. We've been all living in fear for months. Uh, and so these pods may um, give uh, those customers that confidence to come to uh, your class. So let's now talk about, uh, you may have uh, fitness sessions for children. So you may have dedicated classes in a gym, or you might provide some sort of classes clubs with physical activities. Um, please do look at the UK Actives Guidance, uh, which is titled there, Framework for Safe Delivery of Children's Activity Provision. Um, it goes into lots of details of things to think about, as an example only, um, ratios of children um, per group. 
Now, uh, for if you have a pool or a spa pool, a whirlpool, you'll want to look at these uh, technical notes by the Pool Water Treatment Advisory Group. Uh, these are for engineers. They're technical information that gets into uh, things like disinfectant, pH levels, what you need to do to clean your spa or pool before you open. And then once you're open, um, how should you continue to keep those clean? Um, so just go straight to the website and look at those particular five documents. Uh, and then there's guidance for more practical guidance. This is for users and managers of, of gyms, uh, those providing lessons. Uh, again, these are the titles of various documents uh, provided by Swim England. Uh, so I encourage you to look at their site and read those guides that are relevant to you. Um, so just to give you an example, the kind of detail that the guides cover, uh, this is just one guide we're looking at here. Um, government guidance talks about things like turning up in your bathing costume under your clothes. It's about minimizing the amount of time you spend in a changing room uh, around others. Uh, specific things to think about if you have flumes, slides, um, minimum three square meters of water per bather. Um, so that's a kind of government guide. Obviously, that's just a few examples. Swim England uh, goes into a lot more detail. So they make the point that three square meters is really the starting point, the absolute minimum. However, that will change for different activities. So it should be six square meters if you're uh, doing aqua aerobics. Um, I say should. Again, this is all risk assessment. These are these are this is guidance. Um, Public swimming, where people are moving a lot more freely, randomly, um, we suggest that those people need have a lot more square meter area uh, per bather. Whereas if people were swimming in lanes, you could um, likely fit in more people because of the way that they are moving around. There's less uh, crossing of paths. And, uh, and so if you think about it, obviously the risk with aerosol is when people are breathing out. Naturally, when you're exercising, you're breathing out more heavily. Um, there's a lot less risk when two people are passing each other. So imagine in one lane, these two people are passing each other very briefly, um, uh, and then they continue to go on down their lane. That's obviously a lot less risk than people swimming uh, side by side. So they continue to breathe out. One virus carrier is breathing out. The other uh, person without the virus is breathing in those aerosols. If those people were side by side while swimming, that would be a greater risk. With any of these situations, ventilation is key. So please do look at the um, ventilation guidance from the AHVAC experts in the follow-up information. There's lots of you know, useful kind of uh, pictures, diagrams that uh, really help understand what the what the guidance is saying. Uh, so it gets down to this level of detail. You know, how do people enter, exit um, the pool, uh, enter changing rooms, uh, showers, etc., in the safest way? So really good guidance. Look at that. Uh, and obviously, if you are uh, one of our local businesses, you can come back to us for more information. Um, and likewise, no matter where you are in the country. Uh, go to your local authority, Environment Health Department, to um, get clarification on, on any of the guidance that's out there. So let's now talk uh, more generally um, about face coverings, visors, gloves. <clears throat> um, face coverings aren't PPE. So in this picture, you'll see top left KN95 and also the middle one, the FFP1 masks, those are uh, PPE. Those have been checked and uh, safety verified, have standards associated with them in terms of how much particles they stop the wearer breathing in. Face coverings are, uh, you know, can be homemade pieces of cloth that um, uh, are just folded and, and you cover uh, your face. Who uh, advise that you should use three layers, um, but there was also a study done uh, in the US uh, by scientists um, looking at 400 homemade coverings, and they said the type of fabric is significant, not just the number of layers. They found that uh, the range of uh, efficiency 
in these masks in stopping particles being breathed out, coughed out, varies between 1% to 79%. So a huge difference in how effective they are. So it's worth looking at that and information that we send around. Uh, something else that uh, I came across uh, was a recent study just published uh, last month. And they were looking at, uh, again, different sort of homemade face coverings. Um, it's worth pointing out that face coverings aren't tested to kind of a, a British or European standard. There is no guarantee on effectiveness, whereas PPE has certain guarantees about being 95% effective, for example. Um, but what was interesting is that some homemade face coverings are actually more effective than those commercially available in shops. So um, I'm not going to spend any time on this because the information will be sent around. You can look at this yourself. So the pictures you see here to the left, they show similar pictures for a range of different face coverings. So this is uh, basically a smoke machine that's there to emulate what would happen if somebody coughed. Uh, and you can see that uh, certain face coverings, I think this one is a handkerchief, even though they're wearing it over the face, uh, uh, there's a lot of leakage through the mask. Others are much more effective. So this is uh, a second after the cough, two seconds, five seconds after the cough. Face visors, they must extend below the chin. They need to wrap around the sides of the face to be effective. We've been asked by businesses uh, in terms of thinking about you know, protection for the staff, should it be wearing visors? Should it be wearing uh, face coverings? So this was the information that we managed to pull uh, together. There is a, a study that looked at the efficacy of face shields. Again, it will be shared after in the follow-up information, um, but that looks at the uh, how effective it is in protecting the wearer or uh, the customer. Um, it's important to think about face visors because the government guidance talks about if you've got staff that are working closely together for extended periods of time, they should be wearing face visors. So it's worth them knowing that uh, you know there are limits to how much protection face visor provides. You'll be aware there's this new face covering law in shops. So we were questioning, well, what does shops mean, retail shops? Um, there is some exceptions, uh, for example, when you're in closed contact services, uh, you don't need, to, the customer doesn't need to wear face coverings if you're going to restaurants, etc. Uh, again, not going into detail because the link goes through all of the detail uh, in that. Um, but as I, just going back to what I was saying um, before, the science is constantly evolving. This law is just, you know, very recent. Bear in mind what I said at the beginning, literally, uh, just a few weeks ago, there's this been open letter by 200 scientists to who talking about their concerns that it's not droplet transmission, it's also airborne transmission. So this may change the advice. All that said, even if the law doesn't change to say that all, uh, all public should wear a face covering in any environment, um, uh, then you can have your own company policies uh, to suggest those things. Now in gyms, that is a lot less practical because obviously you're, you're heavy breathing whilst you exercise. And so gy what gyms are doing is they're focusing on having really good ventilation to try and create that almost outdoor, fresher environment. So that, um, just because customers aren't wearing face uh, coverings, that doesn't mean to say it's that uh, gyms, for example, are necessarily uh, less, significantly less safe as an indoor space than other uh, spaces. Companies need to think about policies in terms of their customers, which I've just touched on, but also staff. Staff may have their own fears about coming to work without being able to wear face covering. They may ask to wear face coverings. The government advises if they're concerned, they should let them. But think about what we're saying about the efficacy of face coverings when they're making that choice. Um, companies need to think about being at a competitive disadvantage. You know, one gym suddenly says, we want everybody to wear a face covering, and other gyms don't. Customers may move on. Now, face coverings aren't an issue in the UK gyms at the moment, but, but this is uh, exactly what's happening in some gyms in the US. 
that customers are being asked to wear face coverings in the gym. So I cannot see whether this may be on the cards for us going forward, but we need to be mindful of these things. Gloves, um, so questions about whether uh, staff should be wearing gloves have come up. There's different sorts of advice. This advice is focused on the close contact service, but obviously it'll be relevant to staff that are cleaning uh, down workstations. There's different guidance in England uh, and Scotland, um, and uh, oh, can't comment on, on those differences. I would just say in, the general advice from Q is that gloves are for medical settings. The emphasis and the guidance generally come up, coming out from government has been frequent hand washing is better than wearing gloves because of um, that false sense of security of wearing gloves and then people start touching their face, touching surfaces. Uh, and it's been recognised that that can be a, a, a risk. The, um, it's worth uh, bearing in mind though that if you're asked in your trade association or government guidance to wear gloves and you don't, that may uh, cause problems uh, for your insurance. Uh, and so if you wish that guidance to be changed in any way, think about going back to the trade association for amendments. If you do feel that it's going to be safer for you not to wear gloves, focus on that frequent hand washing. So um, now we've done all the risk assessment, you know, the premise is safe. Obviously that is just the first step. You need to recognize that one in three customers don't feel confident about the health and safety when they go to shops, they go to pubs. There's been lots of surveys, there's been ones in the fitness industry as well, um, different percentages, but roughly a third or more people when surveyed say, don't uh, feel fully confident uh, about their, their safety going into these indoor places. So you need to think, what do we need to do to counter that fear? First simple step is obviously do your risk assessment and then display these COVID secure notices. This essentially says that your premise is COVID secure. A couple of things involved there. You've done the risk assessment. You've done the cleaning, hand washing uh, procedures. You're trying to keep your staff at home as much as possible. You're thinking about social distancing. Here's an example of one premise is display this notice. You can see in the bottom sort of left there. But um, you need to think about practicalities. Um, that notice is just completely buried uh, once you start putting in place certain things in the premise. Obviously, this is a cafe setting, but think about the notice in regards to your premise. You need, again, it shouldn't be a tick box exercise feeling that you need to display it. You need to think um, about a customer who's never been to a gym before or never seen the, the uh, signage displayed. Would they easily spot it uh, as they walk past your gym and then when they enter the gym? Um, because obviously you want to attract more customers back to your gym. You might have noticed a drop in membership because of the fears. Now, there's no use just having those notices inside your gym. So think about how you display that information outside. Here's an example of a premise that's displayed as much as they can right next to their, um, where they serve customers. But again, it's easily lost. Now the A4 notice is just, you know, uh, uh, something that government's created. It doesn't stop you creating much bigger banners or whatever is relevant for your business to get the message across that you're COVID secure. You could have a huge banner outside your premise uh, putting across that information. Think about your, on your website. So, but most people nowadays, before they've even stepped out the door, they're looking at your website to, to see uh, to help them make a decision what they're going to do, whether they're buying, they're using their, ser their services. So put in place some clear, prominent information on your homepage about the steps you've taken to keep them safe. Now that can be anything from publishing your risk assessment, which will be obviously a clearly a detailed, very long document. Not everybody will want to read it, but for those customers who need to see that level of detail, then you know, there's no harm putting it out there to put their mind at rest. They will then clearly see that you have thought about each and every single little step to keep them safe. Or you could summarize the information. So um, uh, Pure Gyms did uh, something called Train Safe. And I'll just, I'll just get Paul to touch on that briefly, because I think what they did was quite clever. It's not just Pure Gyms saying, you've done everything to keep you safe and here's some FEQs. 
can you just touch on what uh, Pure Gyms did in terms of bringing in a doctor and in your setup? information yeah um i think my video's got here um we had obviously in terms of um our ceo he was um all over when we closed about telling his own media and everything and in order to move forward we just got this the main sort of doctor inside uh, one of our main doctor and scientists whether we took him on board or, um at the beginning just advise us so when we did construct the uk active advice, the advice to pass to uk active that it wasn't just coming from a, um, a a commercial point of view, like we're just trying to get our gyms open because we just want to get the money back in. So we had to have some sort of credence behind it. So just, I suppose, in a way, it was just like the government, their scientific advisors, so did we. So they would advise us on certain stuff, and that's why the measures that we implemented about the two metres continued as opposed to, and kept it that way. We didn't change um, as the rules were changed throughout the, government, uh, throughout the country going from one meter plus etc so um yeah no it was it was just it was just to make sure that we had the right getting some good sound advice from a, a good authority as opposed to us just making the decision on our own yes yeah excellent yeah i i thought it was um i mean i just you, you know google around um gyms uh, and pure gyms was one of the examples that came across and i really liked the 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 there's a good summary overview there's lots of pictures there's a virtual tour, so you can really get a feel for what the gym looks like inside, what steps have been taken. So it's more, so much more meaningful than just lots of text. But I really like the example of bringing in this doctor who did his own sets of FAQs and really went into a lot of detail. You know, there wasn't a question that I still had at the end of it that wasn't answered in some way. What, on a personal level, my big concern around um, gyms, noting you know, that people are breathing out more, was around ventilation. And they've even covered that, um, talking about ventilation and how quickly um, these, you know, somebody uh, comes to the gym that's got the virus and they're breathing out those particles and it's in the air. It talks about how the ventilation, how quickly it can clean up the air so it brings in a new, fresh supply of air. So it's certainly put my mind at rest as somebody that's potentially thinking about coming back to Jim and I'm perhaps the more paranoid of uh, people out there with doing all these uh, COVID uh, webinars. So thanks for that. Uh, also think about linking in, once you've created all that information on your website, link it in with your marketing materials. So in all the information you get out on your social media, et cetera, networks, um, just to um, give you a, a, an example, I, you know, I was in a restaurant the other week, uh, restaurant with a, a premise um, where you also they also had a, a, a basement uh, tables, uh, and I was sitting downstairs uh, in, in the in this basement of tables with uh, it was just us and one other group uh, in this space. But I'm sitting there, and as the minutes are taken on, I'm looking at the website, looking for information to see what steps they've done to keep people safe. There's nothing mentioned on there at all. I'm looking at the air conditioning. I'm questioning in my mind, is this place safe? Um, now, your customers that come in may have those fears about whatever it is that doesn't put the mind at rest. And they may just walk away and, uh, and never come back. They may not raise that concern with the business. Uh, <clears throat> I did ask the question of the manager. I asked you know, whether that was a fresh air supply coming in and he put my mind at rest. Um, but there were certain things that... Um, uh, they clearly hadn't thought about and this is why it's important to once you put in place processes test them out so for example they had a instead of menus they now have this qr code uh where it's a little uh sheet of paper on the on the table and with your phone you click on it and you bring up the menu but when we got to the menu page it was completely unintelligible <laughs> none of us could find the drinks or the food menu so uh, two of us in the party had to ask staff to explain where we go on this website. Now, while they're explaining over our shoulders where they're going, that member of staff is in much more contact for a greater length of time with uh, the customers than they should have been. So clearly they hadn't tested that on, uh, you know, Joe Public uh, and, and tweaked that. Now, this is all new, completely new steps. There will be problems, things go wrong. So think about how you get feedback. Have the, have the option to, for customers and staff to leave, leave anonymous feedback 
wherever possible uh, so you can make those improvements. Think about increasing prices. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, obviously you're spending a lot of money on these safety measures. There is a cost attached to that. You will see, see across various industries that uh, businesses are putting a 5% COVID-19 supplement. Um, so do you consider that? Because uh, generally speaking, people will expect that there's a cost attached and if the whole industry is doing it, it should be easier uh, and, uh, and more accepted by, by your customers. Um, I wanted to kind of give, again, touching on the context here. This is a long-term thing. Nobody knows when, when we're going to be uh, out of this. But, um, you know, all the thinking that's reported is, you know, that this new normal may be a good year of, of us operating the, in this sort of uh, different ways of, of going about socialising, going to the gym, etc. And, and again, it's, it's just really as part of context, uh, this was a, an example slide from WHO talking about the, uh, the latest epidemics over the last five or so years. Because of globalization, everybody's traveling around the world. There, unfortunately, it is uh, likely that we will see more epidemics spreading from uh, you know, different countries and moving across uh, different parts of the world. So it's something to be mindful of when you're thinking about the costs associated. I have had questions from businesses in different sectors saying, Luke, this is a lot of money for us to invest in something for a few months. It isn't just a few months. You know, you're talking about some of these steps may need to be in place for a year. It may be that in two, three years time, we have something else similar where we need to bring in these safety measures again. So just be mindful of that uh, when you're deciding whether it what uh, steps uh, and equipment, etc., cetera, um, that you put in place. There is um, some very good, um, uh, there's a good web page that government's created now on helping businesses identify all the support that's available for you. Whether well, it's grants, loan, further advice. Uh, we appreciate there's lots of information out there. It's a minefield. This um, particular link that you see up here is very useful because you put in the size of business, the type of business, the sector, and it's very focused uh, financial advice tailored to yourself. Um, in terms of marketing tips to try and get customers back in and, and, and uh, get messages, positive messages out to your customer base, <clears throat> do have a look at your trade association reopening guides because that, in many guides that I've come across, you don't just talk about the safety measures, you also talk about this uh, aspect as well. Just a couple of things that I've picked up out of some documents is in terms of e-marketing, social media networks, we know with customers, the public at large tell us with social media, customers don't just want to see promotional business information. They like to get a more personal touch. They like to get some insight into the life of the business. So, you know, use this opportunity to tell them about what's been happening in your business and your sector in the last three months. Um, and, you know, it's part of telling the story about what you've done to change uh, your operations, the way you're trading going forward. Virtual tools, tours, I can't stress how important this is. I was speaking to Paul the other week. At the moment, pure gyms have a virtual tool that's, you know, of one gym somewhere in the country, which is great. It talks about, it gives you an example of what a pure gym somewhere looks like. But it's really important for somebody that wants to visit the Wandsworth, the Putney gym, to see what does my gym actually look like inside? Or what does my swimming pool look like? So where you can, do a little video that walks people through from the entrance into you know changing areas, into the swimming pool. Example as much as you can what the experience will look like and that will go a long way to, to reassure them. Now, um, obviously this has been, you know, horrific for uh, many businesses, uh, been shut down for months, uh, not making any income. It's been very difficult uh, out there. Uh, and nobody wants to see this kind of second wave of sector, sector closures. We don't want more local, lo local lockdowns. You may be aware that um, uh, in Leicestershire, I believe it was, they've had to go to a, a lockdown because of a particular spike in that area. We don't want this in our locality. You don't want this um, in gyms. So what you need to do is 
the first step is obviously become COVID secure yourself. Do everything you can in your premise to keep, uh, uh, to do things right. Um, and report those businesses that you become aware of who aren't implementing those safety standards. You can report that to the HSC helpline or your local authority. Now, I want to kind of put your mind at rest. This isn't, uh, not everybody will be comfortable uh, reporting their competitors. It is completely anonymous. And, you know, we are, you know, we are here to support businesses. So how we're dealing with, we've been dealing with these kind of reports over the months uh, of places being open that should have been shut. Our approach is generally advice first. You know, we are there to support businesses. Uh, obviously, there are rules that you should be implementing, and we're there to help you in any way we, you, we can to help you get things right. Um, it's only where business isn't taking uh, those reasonable steps, those reasonable measures, that uh, we will then be considering enforcement. So I hope that puts your mind at rest. If you do come across somebody and you're, you're having that question to whether to, to report it or not. Okay, so that's um, it in terms of uh, the content. I will open it up um, for questions um, to uh, any of the speakers. Oh, and sorry, one last thing before I, I do that. Um, I was going to ask um, Ravina just to touch on, you know, what do you do if uh, you find a customer uh, has the virus, he's, he's visited your gym? Uh, and she just briefly touch on what you need to think about there. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just going to touch on the um, RIDOR regulations. You're probably all, all aware of them already. So RIDOR stands for the Reporting of Injuries, Diseases and Dangerous Occurrences. Um, you're probably familiar for them from pre-COVID. So if somebody was to leave your premises in an ambulance, it would be reportable. Um, but now it's been updated to include COVID-19 as well. Um, but the update with COVID-19 is only related to op occupational exposure, so as a result of a person's work. So if an, somebody that visits your gym does, like a service user, does get coronavirus, COVID-19, that would not be reportable under RIDOR. You should only make a report under RIDOR and there's three circumstances on the HSC website. So I'll read out the circumstances, but I'll also put the link in the chat so you can easily look through it. So. If an accident or incident at work has occurred, which could have led to the release or escape of coronavirus, that one must, re must be reported as a dangerous occurrence. If a person at work has been diagnosed as having COVID-19 and is attributed to an occupational expo exposure to coronavirus, this must be reported as a case of disease. And if a worker dies as a result of occupational exposure to coronavirus, this must be reported as a work-related death due to exposure to a biological agent. So I know that's a lot to take in, but um, I'll post this link in the chat and you can contact me if you've got any queries. But the main message to take out of this is um, COVID reporting COVID-19 under Riddle is when, when it is a result of a person's work only. So if somebody was coming to the gym, say if I went to the gym this evening and next week I've got, I unfortunately catch it, could be from the gym, could be from a restaurant I visited, could be in a, that doesn't need to be reported under RIDOR, only work, only as a result of a person's work. So I know it's a lot to take in, but the HC's website lays out what I've just said, and I'll pass that on. So um, any questions, you can contact me. And if there's anything else you think worth touching on, Ravina, uh, so, yeah, so um, you've got the NHS's track and trace, you need to support that, which is probably a lot easier for gyms compared to a bar or a restaurant in the sense that you've already got your members they have, to, they have to either scan a QR code or key in their code to get in so you know who's visited your gym on what day but you need to make sure you've got a means of accessing on a particular day who visited the, the gym and you need to keep that information for 21 days in case the NHS test and trace team contact you um, but that you've probably got that covered already really just as long as you've got a way of logging onto your system and saying I'm the first of August, these, these people came to the gym and then you'll be able to provide that information to the um, to the NHS teams. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and that's reminded me, um, <clears throat> yeah, the the um, UK Active Guidance uh, reminds gyms, uh, obviously for your current members, it's fine. You're already recording their details, but uh, you will have customers that want to trial out the gym 
or come and visit. So to do have a process in place to record their details as well. They won't have a, they won't be scanning in obviously when they enter. And it's not just about uh, keeping customer details. You need to also know which members of staff were at work uh, on uh, the particular days. So you know everybody, staff and customers that need to be contacted. Okay, that's great. Um, if uh, we, we open it up now to um, any questions you may have uh, for any of the speakers. I've unmuted you all now. Um, if you want to talk, you will also, you may still need to unmute yourself at your end. Just look to the bottom left corner and press the microphone button if you have a question. Yes, it's uh, Jerry Cuthbert speaking. Hello. Um, just as by way of background, I'm, I uh, chair a residence association where we operate a, um, a community hall. So it's slightly different from uh, a gym. But uh, of all the webinars, I thought this, was, this would be the most appropriate. Um, one of the things that uh, concerns me, we're, we're currently closed and uh, haven't reopened yet. One of the things that concerns me is cleaning, um, because we probably need to organize a much greater cleaning regime. And I'd be interested to hear any, anybody's experiences and advice they could give me of, about how we tackle that particular problem. Okay. So there is um, information on, so basically just in a non-healthcare setting, the advice is, uh, you know, just using uh, diluted um, bleach is effective uh, as part to kill the virus particles. Um, so you need to think about that in terms of cleaning. You also, what I mentioned earlier about ventilation is one of the key things. So you've both got to think about ventilation, the fresh air, to reduce the risk of people breathing in the particles in a, in a closed hall and you need to have this cleaning regime so it's not just the first thing is obviously clean before you reopen so that'll be a thorough cleaning and then you need to think about frequent cleaning uh, during the day minimizing um, the number of shared uh, things so perhaps you have things like magazines newspapers uh, in, a, in this community space you need to limit those limit the number of things that people touch. Uh, um, you also need to think about much more focus on cleaning high touch points, so light switches. So I can give some, that just summarizes it, but we can send you um, the link. There's two things. There is a guidance for community halls and also there's some guidance by an organization, I think it's called UK Locality, um, which ha also gives some very good practical uh, things to consider. Um, and you need to also, the other things that they raise is obviously in community hall settings, it, it may be, uh, because of the nature of it, there may be more older and more vulnerable people that want yes. to come to those halls. And so you need to be very mindful of uh, making sure that they, that, um, that you get good information out to them for them to think about um, the steps you're taking to keep people safe. I was talking at community hall webinar the other week and they were talking about practicing, rehearsing in the hall uh, and at a practical level, wherever possible, you can take those practice sessions outside. So there's, right. I know you've asked about cleaning, but we can't go into a lot of detail, in, in yeah, detail here, but I'm going to send you some more information that Thank will help you, you um, think about all those practical changes. That'd be very useful. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, any other uh, queries? or concerns, uh, whether it's something that you've read or something you've heard in today's webinar. Okay, there was a question in the chat. Um, somebody was asking that they couldn't see the documents. I kept mentioning we'll send some uh, documents. So what we'll do after the webinar, uh, I'll circulate uh, it'll be on our website and I'll circulate to those that have been invited uh, and turned up the day. Uh, basically a document that gives you all the links to the regulatory advice, the studies that I've mentioned um, and any financial uh, and other
other support that's available. So everything you've seen that I've just touched on, you can read um, at your leisure in a lot more detail. The Regulator Services Partnership, as I say, serves um, the boroughs of London, uh, boroughs of Richmond, Merton and Wandsworth. So we are here to particularly support businesses based in our locality. I say that because I appreciate some of your national gyms with, with um, premises elsewhere. Any local business is um, free to come to us for more tailored advice in terms of whether it's risk assessment or particular queries around any guidance. You can contact us and, uh, and we will help you out. 